Hoy tenemos el honor de contar con el profesor Thomas Crow, Thomas Crow, a quien agradecemos de nuevo su presencia en esta sala. Y digo de nuevo porque ya vino en el año 93, participó en el curso sobre el paisaje. Es uno de los historiadores de arte más reputados en este momento en el mundo y uno de los máximos exponentes de la nueva historia del arte en Estados Unidos, en la que ha realizado importantes contribuciones en la historiografía y la crítica del arte centrándose en la historia del arte moderno desde el siglo XVIII hasta lo contemporáneo. Varios de sus libros, además, están traducidos al español. Le remito a, a la bibliografía que tiene la carpeta, entre ellos La inteligencia del arte del Fondo de Cultura Económica en el año 2009. Desde el año 2007 es profesor de arte moderno en, en la Universidad de Nueva York y con anterioridad trabajó en otras universidades como la del sur de California y fue director del Departamento de Historia del Arte en la Universidad de Yale, en Sussex también, en Michigan y en Chicago. También ha sido director del Instituto de Investigación de la Fundación Getty entre el año 2000 y 2007, haciendo una importantísima labor en cuanto a conferencias, publicaciones, becas y relaciones con otras instituciones. Su carrera está reconocida con importantes premios, honores y becas. Es miembro también de la Academia Nacional de las Artes y Ciencias y colabora como editor en la revista Art Forum. La conferencia tiene por título Retratos de un Papa, cautivo y restaurado en el trono. David, Ingres y Lorenz. Well, many, many thanks, and I want to uh, express my gratitude to Nuriel de Miguel and to Inés Cobo for arranging to bring me here and, and um, being so uh, gracious and interested in my contributing to, the, uh, to this cycle of uh, lectures uh, sponsored by the, the Fundación Amigos of the, of the Prado Museum. It, I've done this once before and it's a very great honor to be invited back to do this again. Now, it's, I think it's um, a fair uh, statement that monumental portraits of popes by English artists are extremely rare, at least before Francis Bacon took up the subject with this savage intensity in 1953. But I'm sure that you're aware that all of Bacon's papal portraits are, have a Spanish origin, being copies of the uh, portrait of Innocent X by Velázquez from 1650. They're not portraits of a contemporary human being. To find an English papal portrait of the same weight uh, or importance before Francis Bacon, one has to go back to 1819 and the depiction of Pope Pius VII by Sir Thomas Lawrence. And not only did Lawrence work from life, but he established a complex personal and intellectual relationship with his sitter. And one aim of this essay will be to try to explain how and why this painting came to exist, and also how it belies Lawrence's historical reputation as something of a lightweight, a facile, superficial flatterer of his aristocratic sitters and little more. In fact, if people uh, want to make the case for his uh, flattery of his subjects, they might well point to a portrait like this one of the Lady Elizabeth Foster, then the mistress of the uh, Duke of Devonshire from 1805. Lawrence depicts his subject in the costume and setting of the Tiburtine Sibyl, the ancient Roman prophetess who was credited with foretelling the coming of Christ. Her ancient seat was at Tivoli, the hilltop settlement with its famous torrents and temple, and the so-called Sibyl's temple can be glimpsed just at the lower right-hand corner of her portrait down in this area here. 
In fact, her father, the dissolute Bishop Earl of, Dar of Derry, had tried to buy the structure for its removal to his estates in Ireland. This kind of reference represents just one of the flattering classical guises that had been common in English portraiture since the ascendancy of Sir Joshua Reynolds. But it may also have been some symbolic compensation for the recent death of, uh, of Bess Foster's father, uh, who had been long resident in Italy where he had dissipated the family fortune on palaces and works of art. The relative poverty occasioned by her father's waywardness and profligacy helped send Bess Foster, as she was known, into the arms of the Devonshires, both Duke and Duchess alike, with whom she formed one of history's most renowned menage a trois. The year after the, this portrait was completed, the famous first Duchess, Georgiana Spencer, died of maladies related to her alcoholism, and Bess soon replaced her as the official duchess in title. Now, we might see this kind of elevated guise as a standard euphemism for all that compromising libertinism and worldliness of a Georgian figure of fashion. But Bess Foster had some greater claim to this costume than most would have had, having in her 20s undertaken an extended grand tour of Italy, which was unusual for a female aristocrat to do. And uh, a little later, in the early 1790s, she toured the continent in the company of no less a figure than Edward Gibbon, the famous author of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Following uh, all the, the despoliations of her father, one could see Lawrence using the imaginative capacity of painting to restore something of what had been taken from her. And restoration is going to become a much larger theme over the course of this talk. Uh, and Bess Foster will remain a large part of it. By the time that Lawrence came to paint his pope, and eight, uh, his pope in 1819, he would also find the new Duchess of Devonshire resident in Rome, where she would be bound up closely with the papal household. And he portrayed her then in this very fine chalk drawing simultaneously with his work on the portrait of the pope. To understand how this set of circumstances came about and how they help explain the achievement of Lawrence's painting, the best place to begin is with the papal subject himself. As his various representations by artists trace an important thread through the history of art. Now most observers are familiar with the likeness of Pius VII from his prominent and essential position in one of the largest and most populated paintings of the era, Napoleon crowning Josephine, which was completed by Jacques-Louis David in 1808. And the Pope can be seen right there. Now, people most readily think of this famous painting as the coronation of Napoleon, who had declared himself emperor in 1804. But the actual moment that was worked out between the artist and uh, his imperial patron, and here you see, uh, see Napoleon pointing out the moment on a visit to David's studio, and we see David uh, second from the right-hand side of this contemporary print, was to show the action that followed Napoleon's own crowning when he turned to crown his consort. In David's orchestration of the event, the pope is made to look on with a kind of vague and ir irresolute gesture of benediction that really fails even to connect with the direction of his gaze. 
But that seemingly odd choice condenses a great deal of tangled history between Napoleon Bonaparte and the Roman church. The self-proclaimed emperor who was leaving behind his republican title of first consul of France saw himself sincerely as standing in a line with Charlemagne. In David's life-size equestrian portrait of the younger General Bonaparte crossing the Alps, the name Carolus Magnus is inscribed in the rock at the immediate threshold of the picture. Famously, of course, Charlemagne had been crowned in Rome by Pope Leo III as Imperator Augustus, the model for a new emperor in the West and protector of the church. And such was precisely what Napoleon imagined himself to be, just as the young artist Angle showed him on the imperial throne in a self-consciously Carolingian guise in 1806. But the difference this time around would be that he would not go to Rome seeking the blessing of the pope, but the pope would have to come to him, just as he ultimately imagined that the seat of the papacy would someday be in Paris. To this end, he had, uh, he had uh, abolished the anti-clerical policies of the Republic and established the Concordat between the Vatican and the French state in 1801. And here's a contemporary print celebrating this event. In service of that agreement and of Napoleon's declared role as the protector of the church, the Pope agreed to the humiliating demand that he travel to the imperial seat uh, in order to participate in the ceremony of the coronation. This was in large part on the advice of his indispensable Secretary of State, the Cardinal Ercole Consalvi, whom Lawrence also depicted in 1819 in this portrait, and it's one along with that of the Pope to which we will be returning. Consalvi, who was never really properly ordained as a priest, was much more a diplomat than he was a prelate, who maneuvered constantly to gain maximum advantage out of the inherently weak position into which the papacy had fallen. So bowing to necessity, Consalvi's advice was that Notre Dame would have to take the place of St. Peter's. In his painting of the coronation, David skipped the literally crowning moment, in part because Napoleon had introduced another change in protocol. In no mind to compromise his ascendancy over the church, he chose by prior arrangement with the helpless pope to crown himself. And this is the way that David recorded that moment in a study that he never used. While the pope cannot have sat for David in the nude, uh, the artist took his customary classicist's approach to the figure in another sketch using an appropriate model to stand in for the Pope's less than sturdy 61-year-old physique. Without having any really emphatic papal gesture or role to record, David played around with the costume. The choice of a simple skull cap the papal white zucchetto over the mitre uh, that he had tried out earlier held more than one advantage. It made no attempt to make more of the subject's subdued role in the proceedings than was fitting and realistic. And there was a dignity in that sort of restraint. It also allowed David to heighten the visibility of the pope's expression as is clearer here in an independent painted study that he made uh, 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 parallel to 
the larger painting. Trying uh, to capture the outwardly modest and unaffected presence that so many witnesses describe and also leaving out the obscuring bulk of the top-heavy miter. Napoleon had already forbidden the, the ornate, you know, beehive-like tiara that popes usually wear on ceremonies of this kind of magnitude. Pius VII seems to have had a way of bonding with artists. And he sat for David a number of times, both for the composition of the coronation of Josephine and for another independent portrait. Now, we don't actually know who commissioned this portrait. It never arrived at, uh, it in the, the possession of the Pope himself, and uh, Napoleon never made a claim to it, though the original version did find its way into the Musée Napoléon. But uh, David thought enough of it to keep a, a, a further replica with him throughout his life so that even when he was sent into exile after 1816, when the, uh, the allied powers of Europe deposed Napoleon, and David was in danger even of execution as a, as a regicide, as an anti-clerical, he kept the portrait of the pope, and we see it here in a, a, a print portrait from that time, from David's old age, when uh, he chose to have himself represented with the papal portrait at his side. And he had a number of these portraits of people who meant a lot to him, with him in Brussels at the end of his life, including the, uh, the Abbe Siez, who was responsible for the incendiary pamphlet, What is the Third Estate, that helped launch the French Revolution back in 1789, and would seem, therefore, to be at the opposite pole of ideology from the pope whose authority anchored the divine right of kings. When David's bust-length portrait went on display in Paris, it was very successful. But there was comment that the pope seemed uncomfortable in both his pose and in his costume. But the expression on the face and in the hands was masterful. But I think that disparity would have been David's uh, explicit intention. The evident lack of comfort allows a separation of the man from the role, which David is at pains to achieve without slighting the office. A preparatory drawing shows a more momentary and engaged expression on the face, as if the subject were speaking, while the painting, by contrast, um, shows a figure where the slightly hooded eyes have become more open and observing, removing uh, the unforced solicitude that brings the papal presence in the drawing down to something like an egalitarian human level. Though the slight smile that's traced on the lips in the painting, I think, retains something of the unforced immediacy of the study. The Pope's slightly lost appearance also points to the physical fact of his small stature and slight build. As the Cardinal Chiaramonti, he had, had not been among the leading candidates in 1799 when Pope Pius VI died while a prisoner of the French. Um, at, this, at this conclave in Venice, uh, rather hastily organized because of the general turmoil in which the Italian peninsula found itself under the, the, the warfare of the young Bonaparte, um, attendants had acquired uh, papal vestments in two sizes, you know, trying to anticipate any candidate who might be selected. 
but they neglected to bring a size small. Uh, so that when the new Pius VII put on the customary white slippers, they had to be stuffed with straw to keep from falling off of his feet. But his lack of an imposing physical presence in the end constituted a form of power, as Napoleon and other adversaries consistently underestimated. As the Pope departed Paris after the coronation, in, at the end of April in 1805, and here's a, 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 an Italian drawing of that, uh, of that event, um, Napoleon had reason to think twice about the wisdom of summoning him to Paris in the first place. Because in contrast to his hasty arrival, Pius VII took his time returning to Italy gathering and blessing devoted crowds all the way along his passage down the valley of the Rhone. Knowing the extent of his following in France stiffened his resolve in resisting Napoleon's inevitable encroachments on the Vatican's secular rule in the Papal States. Um, and when he stood firm against surrendering authority uh, over Rome to the French, which he did, he confounded French expectations that he was the mild and soft character that he seemed to be presenting in public while he had been in Paris. In fact, in May of 189, he excommunicated Napoleon. And not two months later, in retaliation, found himself kidnapped by a zealous young general who was obviously hoping to match his emperor's reputation for audacity. Then the pope was sort of moved along, we would say like a hot potato, from the territory of one Napoleonic vassal to the next, up the line as far as France, because none of them wanted to face the reaction of arrested populace to the presence of a, an imprisoned pontiff in their midst. Eventually, he was sequestered in the little town of Savona uh, along the Italian Riviera. And this is a photograph of what became his audience room in exile. And he uh, was kept there for a period of captivity that endured some three years, hemmed in more and more. Finally, his writing desk was confiscated to keep him from uh, uh, smuggling out any further unauthorized correspondence. But after uh, you know, <laughs> a quick trip back to Fontainebleau uh, and then being returned to Savona, suddenly on May 24th of 1814, he was finally back in Rome. Napoleon had fallen in his first uh, defeat uh, and uh, the, the Pope's five year odyssey of captivity had come to an end. By that date, the young French painter, uh, Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres, whose work we've already uh, seen, uh, was sitting out the war years in Rome. And he had received a commission from a patron back in France that he paint the Sistine Chapel. Now, the result of that commission is a relatively small but densely packed composition which is now in the National Gallery in Washington, DC. While undertaking the initial work on the commission, he had written to his patron specifying how he wanted to treat the chapel interior. He had chosen, he reported, and I quote now, the moment when the miserere is sung, all the cardinals kneeling in their places, viewed from behind, and the pope kneeling at the altar, as is his custom, end of quote. Well, from what you can readily see in the painting, Angle changed his mind, changed his conception in such a way that the pope is now standing in his full glory in the observation of holy Thursday. 
Angler went on to specify, to, uh, you know, in his message to his patron, every personage in the painting, including the Cardinal Consalvi, among those who are right next to the Pope. All, of course, you'll have to remember, without having observed any of them in Rome during the years uh, 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 when he was creating the painting, because they were all still in exile, Consalvi included. He um, relates to his patron that he'd chosen to dress the Pope in white, quoting, for the effect of my picture, having no other way to draw the light to him. But he nonetheless feels that he remembers seeing all the dais and the Pope dressed in that color. His words again. He told his patron that he should place it in the big, you know, annual salon exhibition in the Louvre uh, under the title Interior View of the Sistine Chapel, Pope Pius VII Conducting a Service. Now it's interesting that Angra is writing these instructions only two days after the return of Pius VII to Rome. So in a way, his painting, though being conceived in a vacuum of experience, had come to life before his eyes. And he tells his patron, don't identify any of these people too precisely, as if he didn't want to be held too closely to what the, the facts of the matter would now uh, you know, uh, evidently be. I think that this, like many others of the works that Angela does in Rome during the teens of the 19th century, is a kind of reply uh, and emulation and critique of David. And even in its small dimensions, it is a, a riposte to the coronation of Josephine. Uh, rivaling David in its conveying of ritual gravity and grand space and crowds of onlookers. But the difference being that the Pope is now at the center rather than being sidelined in the way that David had done. Even with the Pope still a captive and the outcome still in the balance between Napoleon and the powers of princely legitimacy, Angra here had restored religion's authority to the command of its own sphere. Angra, the traditionalist, though young, uh, had uh, taken the opportunity to correct history by placing the absent Pope on the throne once again. He includes a large segment in the upper right of the, uh, of the lower uh, section of Michelangelo's Last Judgment, the Company of the Damned, uh, as both commentary on the Pope's enemies and a warning to enemy, any, any such enemies that might emerge in the future. I think all this is going on, at least in Angla's private imagination. But he needed to be on guard, as I said a moment ago, against offering uh, any too close a likeness. So he uh, evaded this, uh, this potential test of the accuracy of his imagery by the miniaturized scale of his doll-like pope. The face is an expressionless mask. The body's made tall in the manner of a carnival mummer by his long gown trailing over the base of the throne. But its intent does not depend on reportage. Angra's was an imaginary act of restoration, one that became real in one of those cunning of history moments at virtually the instant he completed the project. Now, Angra conferred this dignity on the Pope in a way that was virtually invisible in Rome. He was not a public person. The painting did not have a public destiny there. But his vision, I think, comes out ahead in every respect 
of the painting that did officially commemorate the return of Pius VII to Rome, the work of Ercole Camuccini, an artist hardly remembered today, but then regarded as the leading artist in the city. Lawrence, uh, Thomas Lawrence, our main subject, I'll bring him back on stage now, offered a shrewd assessment of the qualities of Camuccini's portrait in a letter he wrote in 1819 to a friend back in England, the artist and diarist Joseph Farrington. He's, he's sort of, of, of uh, um, detailing the precedence for his own portrait of the Pope. And he uh, allows that the subject had been, quote, very successfully painted by David and by Camuccini, the first two painters of Paris and Rome, respectively. The reput reputation of the former you will well know, and the latter is an able artist, and from his character and manners deservedly esteemed. His portrait of the Pope generally pleased. It was exceedingly well drawn and with a very forcible effect. But he did not encounter, take on board, the difficulties of his subject. He chose, if I may say so, its too obvious and quiescent character. His view of the face was nearly a profile with eyes and head and frame bending down, an image of respectable decay." End of quote. Despite the politeness of Lawrence's phrasing, the final verdict is really a damning one. Camuccini, he concludes, has failed to do what David had accomplished, that is to use the Pope's slight stature and stooped posture as a way to establish intimacy and a sense of authority that transcends physical considerations. In Camuccini's hands, those qualities become no more than what one sees, occasions for sympathy maybe, but not for the kind of admiring reverie that Lawrence had in mind for his own version. This was the one that was meant to trump them both, trump both David and Camuccini at the same time. And these are Lawrence's words again, which pick up from the same passage. I have painted him full in front with all but the eyes immediately directed to you, with every detail of his countenance, and it is one of many minute parts, but these animated with benevolence and a sort of mild energy that is the real character of his intellect and nature. The securing of this with a good and true tone of color has given me undisputed victory <laughs> and has still more established the superiority of our English school. Well, I think it's time to take up the question with which I began the lecture. That is to ask, how did Lawrence find himself in a position to compare so triumphantly Camuccini's portrait with one of his own? That is to say, how did the leading portraitist of the leading Protestant nation come to paint the Pope along with an equally grand portrayal of the pontiff's long-serving Secretary of State, Consalvi? And for his part, Lawrence asserted equal success in Cardinal Consalvi's portrait. Um, uh, and these are his words, who has so fine a countenance that it seemed difficult to satisfy the public expectation, end quote. But of course, I have, is his, uh, is his uh, boast to Farrington. The source of the commission for both portraits was the British Prince Regent, ruling the future George IV, ruling in the stead of his increasingly unstable father. And this is Lawrence's own contemporaneous portrait of him. 
The Prince Regent had insisted that Lawrence undertake an extended European sojourn uh, in order to complete a, a, an enormous gallery of life-size um, uh, figures of the leading personalities in the, in the great campaign to bring down the French emperor. He even knighted Lawrence at this point so he could be more of a social equal with his subjects. Lawrence had begun this undertaking when a number of these rulers, commanders, and diplomats visited London in 1814. Here are two of them, including the portrait of the Tsar Alexander on the left. But he wasn't able to chase down all of his quarry until his visit to Rome uh, five years later. Now it was natural in, you know, in the in the in the this uh, population of key figures in the defeat of Napoleon and then the carving up of Europe that took place afterwards at the Congress of Vienna, that both the Pope and Consalvi should be included, and they would all hang together at Windsor Castle in the so-called Waterloo Chamber, one built especially to house them, devoted, you might say, to a collective portrait of reaction. But in the mind of the Prince Regent and his European counterparts, it would be a collective portrait of restoration, the rollback of all the changes set in motion by the French Revolution in which the Pope and his secretary had been prime players. But there was more than official duty behind Lawrence's warming to his subject, and more indeed to the Prince Regent's desire for these Roman portraits. One has only to listen to Lawrence's breathless descriptions of his life in the seat of Catholic Christendom to grasp this extra dimension. Here he is, and this will be a fairly long quote, but I think its vividness will, uh, will uh, justify its length. Here he is describing uh, an evening in a way that is difficult to condense, and I quote. I was yesterday, St. Peter's Day, a spectator of doubtless the most superb ceremony and spectacle that this world can exhibit, the celebration of high mass in St. Peter's. No words of mine can have the power of conveying to you the magnificence and grandeur of it. And just to stand in, I'll show you a drawing also by Angla uh, from inside the great papal church. Now, back to Lawrence. By the care of the cardinal, Consalvi, and the persons having direction of the ceremony, I was placed nearer to the pope than any other foreigner with the exception of the Duke of Saxe-Gotha and some other persons of rank. In that seat that ranges on the side and immediately behind the cardinal, so that I had an entirely convenient view of the whole ceremony. Titian has never conceived anything more gorgeous and at the same time solemn and in dignity than the accompaniments and dresses of the personages in this scene. At three o'clock, I dined with Lady Shaftesbury and in the evening called on the Duchess of Devonshire to go with her and her friends to Vespers at St. Peter's. We stayed going frequently around that noble area till the second illumination and then drove to the house immediately opposite to the bridge and castle of San Angelo to see its display of fireworks from the room and balcony that had recently been occupied by their imperial majesties. And by that he means the Austrian emperor and empress. The night before, I had seen the fireworks from the same place by the Cardinal Consalvi's direction. When the whole was over, I went to the French ambassador's Comte Blaca, which is always attended by the first society, and about one o'clock returned to the Quirinal Palace. End quote. 
Well, Lawrence is here, he's kind of writing out over the, over the uh, kind of canvas of his life in Rome, the same infatuation that he had expressed about the complexity of the papal countenance. You remember him saying, many minute parts, but these animated with benevolence and a sort of mild energy that is the real character of his intellect and nature, end quote. He takes that form of, uh, of infatuation and inscribes it across the whole of Rome, turning on a special infatuation with St. Peter's, a topic that he comes back to repeatedly in his letters. Even more than Lawrence just acting out the wide-eyed grand tourist who had never been in Rome before, such effusions accompany a giddy insertion into a strangely crypto-Catholic way of life conducted by some of the highest English aristocracy, lingering in Rome as a set of Catholic, Catholic fellow-traveling expatriates with whom the artist fell into step without missing a beat. When Lawrence ended the evening at the Quirinal Palace, he was returning to the generous apartment supplied to him by the Pope, and this was the papal residence of the period, when Pius VII was the sovereign of the entire territory, and not just the tiny Vatican as he is today. And it was there that Lawrence fashioned both portraits. His fascination with the spectacle of St. Peter's is right there to be seen in his rendering of Bernini's facade of the church in mixed shadow and sun, the flare of evening illumination like the fireworks seen from the Castel San Angelo opposite, the shadow serving to emphasize the force of the cardinal's brightly lit face. The Duchess of Devonshire, with whom we uh, began the, this evening's talk, uh, was the Cardinal Consalvi's closest companion at the time. They saw one another nearly every day, and she was the only other person permitted to enter his private garden hideaway, which was about the greatest accolade he could present to another human being. And in that capacity, she knit this English upper crust fascination with papal pomp and splendor into the tight social fabric of their community. Both her stepson, the sixth Duke, and the French writer Lamartine called her the uncrowned queen of Rome. Among other exploits, she organized archaeological excavations in the Forum. She uh, sponsored the publication of luxurious uh, illustrated editions of Horace and Virgil in Italian translations. And before Lawrence left Rome to go back to London, she begged him for a pencil version of his portrait of Consalvi, which she was said ever afterward to have carried with her at every moment. Both of these angels were watching over Lawrence. Uh, as um, Lawrence uh, wrote uh, to Farrington, quote, the Cardinal Consalvi told me with apparent pleasure his pleasure in a highly courteous nature of communicating pleasure, that when proposing to the Pope the introduction of foreign ambassadors on the usual day, his holiness desired that it might be changed as he had engaged to sit with me. As the Cardinal himself remarked it as a compliment to me, it is not boasting to tell it to you. End quote. And not is capitalized in the letter, as he, of course, boasts, uh, you know, almost without shame. And Lawrence was not in other uh, 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 times and places modest about his achievement. He wrote to a, a, a female uh, uh, acquaintance in June 1819 um, that... 
quote, no picture that I have painted has been more popular with the friends of its subject and the public than my portrait of His Holiness. And according to my scale of ability, I have executed my intention, giving him that expression of unaffected benevolence and worth, which lights up his countenance with a freshness and spirit, entirely free, except in the characteristic paleness of his complexion, from that appearance of illness and decay that he generally has when enduring the fatigue of public functions." End quote. Now, the theme of Pius VII's frail physique has dogged public perceptions over his entire realm, and I've cited quite a number of them over the course of the talk so far. Where David, however, had turned a putative deficiency of command into a sentimental advantage, Lawrence claimed to have overcome his subject's weakness through sheer artistic alchemy. But he didn't rely only on his way with the subject's face and hands to ensure his work's success and to make certain that it carried the right set of meanings back to his own sovereign. Lawrence had absorbed, whether he knew the anecdote or not, the wisdom that had been offered by Bernini to Louis XIV when Bernini traveled to Paris to sculpt the portrait bust of the French king and to offer his designs for the renovation of the Louvre. He said to Louis XIV, the portrait is limited to mere exterior likeness, but the plans for the Louvre, his plans, were the portrait of the king's soul. The grand schemes of the king, he said, are the portrait of his soul. The refurbished St. Peter's served this function quite literally in Lawrence's portrait of Consalvi, where one sees on the table the thick bound plan that the cardinal had published in 1816 devoted to all the reforms and renovations that he wanted to undertake in the Papal States following the restoration. But what of the great works of antiquity, the Laocoon and the Belvedere Apollo, that are visible in the dramatically shadowed vault of the Vatican Museum, seen just adjacent to the Pope's right hand and to the ring of the fisherman, his, his most kind of uh, uh, clear and personal badge of office. What we seem to be seeing is a vaulted space that wasn't even finished yet. It was naturally one of Consalvi's reforms that the Braccio Nuovo of the Vatican, and here we see what it looks like today, would lend dignity, uh, proper classical dignity, to the papal collection. In the painted version by Lawrence, the backlit Apollo seems to sit on top of the Pope's hand like a genie. And the dynamic rising curve of the serpents enveloping Laocoon and his sons, uh, a, a passage for which Lawrence had prepared himself with this remarkable study of the central figure, that rise continues and enlivens the trajectory established by the white sleeve and the ermine of his cape. Is this too an instance of the sovereign's grand schemes serving as the portrait of his soul? I would say emphatically, yes, even more so than St. Peter's facade behind Consalvi, as this feature of the papal portrait points directly to the larger topic of restoration as the guiding theme of Lawrence's entire series. These two Roman antiquities had conspicuously figured, perhaps been the uh, symbolic tokens of the, uh, for the return of the works of art that had been commandeered and taken to Paris by Napoleon Bonaparte from 1796 onwards. With Napoleon's defeat, the papacy had two principal orders of business with the victorious allies. 
The largest was the return of the Papal States, which had been a plaything between the French and the Austrians out of the Pope's hands since the mid-1790s. And the second, different in scale, but almost equal in symbolic import, was the repatriation of the scores of art objects that had been uprooted and taken to Paris from Italy. Now, the ambition to recover the Papal States might seem the more difficult of the two, but actually that seemed to have come rather easily. Um, uh, but the second one turned out to be more protracted. Um, Antonio Canova, here we see him in a, a portrait by Lawrence, uh, became fast friends after Canova's visit to London in 1815, Canova having been uh, deputized by the Pope to serve as the principal diplomat and agent for the return of the stolen works of art. Um, as another token of this relationship, uh, Lawrence in the papal portrait included this document in the Pope's hands, which is the warrant of nobility for his friend Canova. In the meantime, he had briefly followed Canova to Paris, uh, where the Italian sculptor was having the devil's own time getting the French, even the Bourbon loyalists, to part with the purloined treasures. In this contemporary French print, we see an artist despairing over the loss of these great models as they're trundled out of the, uh, out of the portal of the palace. Every obstacle was being put in Canova's way, however, and little support was forthcoming from the Central European powers. But in a short space of time, Consalvi and Pius VII, in a startling reversal of their recent fortunes, found themselves with both territories and the majority of the Italian art objects restored to them. And the principal mover behind both policy successes was none other than Great Britain. Lord Liverpool and secondarily the Prince Regent, who had no desire to see the Austrians back in a dominant position in Italy, and pushed for the artworks return for, well, what reasons? What, why would they have been so motivated to apply pressure to bring about this key symbolic act of restoration? Well, the Duke of Wellington probably had a big role to play. He'd come out strongly in favor of repatriation as a way of diminishing French attachment to their former glories, which he saw as having fueled Napoleon's return in the Hundred Days and the necessity for the second defeat at Waterloo. In any event, the Prince Regent, following Wellington's lead, personally overcame the largest practical obstacle in the way of the enterprise. That was the sheer cost of the freight, which he guaranteed to pay. And he didn't demand any of the works in recompense. So the Prince Regent, never really having been a prime mover in all of this diplomacy, managed by his endorsement of these pro-papal policies to put himself in a much more favorable public light than he was used to enjoying. Could then the repatriated antiquities constitute for its patron the most flattering portrait of his soul? So what I'm saying is that the, the, the restorations that exist in the two uh, uh, portraits of Consalvi and Pius VII are the portraits of their souls, but then by extension, the portraits taken together become a flattering portrait of the soul of the Prince Regent who has brought about their capacity to, uh, you know, to succeed in these great acts of restoration and repair. No other objects, uh, more than the Laocoon or the Belvedere Apollo, so condensed and embodied the theme of restoration. And by that token, 
Lawrence's portrait of the Pope by making the most glamorous and charismatic objects of restoration into the Pope's signal attributes, not religious attributes, but secular, classical, artistic ones, would have constituted for the soon-to-be George IV a reminder of the one piece of glory he could claim from the restoration of legitimate and monarchical Europe um, uh, that by this date, by 1819, had been consummately effected. For Lawrence, the two Vatican portraits capped an extraordinary ascendancy, even for a painter who had been in the past so enmeshed already in the company and esteem of the English aristocracy. The son of a tavern keeper, he had ascended not only to a knighthood, but to an easy non-vocational familiarity with figures as august on the European stage as the Prince Metternich in whose carriage he would go to view the waterfalls of Tivoli or the Colosseum by moonlight. Such marks of personal acceptance, which were immensely and unabashedly relished by the artist, had nonetheless to be earned by more than charm and more than sycophancy. Lawrence was fulfilling a deep need on the part of the elite who had gathered at the Congress of Vienna. For those uh, figures, from you know the Czar to the Austrian Emperor, uh, to diplomats like Castlereagh and Metternich, there was no Velasquez or Rubens on hand to conjure a grand, multi-figured allegory of their post-Napoleonic settlement. There was going to be no surrender at Breda that any artist of the time was capable of producing. The skills required for such a task, if they existed, were the property of French artists who were all compromised by service to the empire. And it's an open question whether such inherited Baroque prototypes would have appeared more than an unconvincing dumb show. Lawrence's abilities, on the other hand, permitted a different concept of artistic commemoration, one distributed across a series of represented individuals and representative individuals, each of whom rendered empathetic and impressive by virtue of qualities carried in their separate persons. This was reaction with a human face and another face and another face and another face until each separate virtue, bravery, tactical genius, political wisdom, prudence, piety, had acquired its personification in a grand multi-part allegory. But one divested of all the outdated symbolic machinery of the 17th century. Amid the swaggering standing figures of princes and generals, the two seated figures, of Consalvi and Pius VII, their authority distinct from force of arms, brought the entire project to its necessary culmination, bearing in miniature the potent traditional symbolism on which allegorical celebrations of rulership had traditionally rested. This would be the allegory of rule, of the restoration of rule for a new and modern age. So thank you very much for your patience and your kind attention. Mm -hmm.